Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for our one minute delay. And also thank you for joining us once again uh, with Gus's founder, David S. Rose, uh, for a brand new uh, kickoff to a curriculum, as well as a brand new topic that we, we've done in other kinds of programming, but we're going to dive deep into uh, term sheets today. So we're kicking off our scale curriculum with this event. Uh, David's here to share his expertise. And David and I were talking right before this. And it's kind of cool because David's been doing this for so long. Uh, I've been doing this for a decade, but even when I started, the state of term sheets and terms and getting deals done were different than they are today, and David's seen it over dozens of years, um, and it's kind of cool to see where we landed. So we're going to deep dive into the common term sheets. Um, scale is all about the company at a scale stage, when you're truly becoming a high growth startup. So while we're going to mention safes, convertible notes, and preferred rounds, this will be the first event that we really dig into preferred round uh, terminologies. Oftentimes, we use them to explain how safes work, but now we can actually dig into what makes them unique uh, as part of this thing. With uh, As always, we are recording this. Uh, we'll upload it uh, to our YouTube channel after we're done with it. Uh, please use the chat in the Q&A uh, throughout. I will try to you know wrangle some questions if I can interrupt David, or we'll definitely save some time for the end. Um, and also feel free to just say where you're coming from and what your startup's name is. Uh, this is not a pitch room. Uh, David is a prolific investor, but we're not doing pitches here. We're talking about the mechanics, how this stuff actually works. Uh, and without further ado, David, take it away. Thank you, Ryan. Hello, everybody. Today, we are discussing term sheets. And you might wonder, what is a term sheet? Why do I want to know about it? And why either have I or have I not come across it so far? And the answer is you would likely not have come across term sheets until such time as you are raising money and you are dealing with investors. And so therefore, a term sheet is at its heart all about the relationship between you as an investor. So before we discuss term sheets, we have to go into the basics of that and discuss who are these investors and what are these investors and why are you discussing term sheets with them anyway? So the first thing to understand is what investors are not. So investors are not your parents. They are not here because it's part of life and you everybody gets one and they're going to support you and help you. They are also not your friends. Now, parents and friends can be investors, but investors are not parents and friends. So your friends do things because they like you or they want to help. That's not the motivation behind angel investors or venture capitalists. They're also not Santa Claus. I know that if you watch some of the TV series and read some of the blogs, it sounds like these investors just pop in and drop money on people. But no, that's not the way it works, no matter what you read. They're also not charitable donors. There is not some third party thing driving this where they are doing this because instead of giving money to their church or mosque, they are giving money to deserving entrepreneurs. There's nothing deserving about an entrepreneur that will get you funding. They're also not in it to save the world. They may be a secondary or tertiary thing for them. We all like saving the world. But again, that's not why they're investing. And despite the name angel investors, and this is one we hear all the time, they are not angelic. Angel investors do not invest in you because they are coming out of heaven with a little harp and saying, hey, take my money. That's not the way it works. That's not what's driving them. And they're also not promiscuous. In that sense, they don't just go around handing out money left and right, walking down the street. They make very careful decisions, and they typically invest in very few companies. So the typical angel investor in, in the United States invests in typically one opportunity a year, maybe two, and for people who are serious about investing. So they're certainly not promiscuous in that sense. So if that's what they're not, what are they? <laughs> angels are hard-headed business people. It may be your parents or your brother or your aunt or something else, and they may clothe themselves in the finery of an angel with a robe and a harp, but they are at core hard-headed business people, and the reason they are investing in your company is they are taking a gamble. They are betting on the best information they have, combination of what they know, what you've told them, what they and you think are projecting going forward, how they can make a lot of money by putting money, risky money now, into your startup today, buying a piece, a share of your company today, holding it for a long time, and the average holding period for an angel investor in the United States is between nine and 10 years, and then ultimately selling their share of your company at some point in the future for a lot more than they paid for it. 
And so therefore, since they're taking a big gamble with what to them and you is a lot of money, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars, no matter how fast you say it, it's a lot of money. They are very careful in this figuring out how they are going to make this investment and they want to protect themselves if it does work and if it doesn't work. <laughs> and so therefore, when an investor puts money into your company, every single thing, every single contingency is carefully written out. This is no smushy thing. This isn't somebody saying, here, take some money and come back when you made a lot of money. No, the details of what they are doing are very, very, very carefully written in pages and pages and pages of text describing every little potential eventuality when good things happen, when bad Bad things happen. If a meteorite comes down and hits the earth, if you have a heart attack, if what if whatever happens, they've got it covered somewhere in this documentation. And so therefore, when you actually sign an investment document, giving part of your company to an investor in exchange for dollars, you can be sure that there are more terms and conditions and specifics and what ifs than you can shake a stick at. Now, the problem would be if you have a typical investor documentation for an equity round in your company, buying a share of your company, which is what investors do, that typically runs to about 125 pages. Now, imagine if you were to try and discuss all 125 pages every time you wanted to see if you could raise $25,000 from an investor. And the answer is no deal would ever get done. And so that's why you don't jump right into writing all the documentations. Instead, you come up first with what's called a term sheet. And a term sheet is not a contract. It's not the final investment documentation. A term sheet instead is a guide to what you're doing. It is an agreement to agree in the future. It's the major big points of what you will eventually put into this big long contract with the investor. So essentially, it is a framework for the negotiation you're going to have with the investor about all of these terms. And by agreeing upfront on the major terms, you avoid a lot of misunderstanding on on both sides. Um, it also can reduce drafting time enormously because people have been doing this for so long and people who invest in multiple companies have invested in so many companies that there are a lot of standard things that if everybody agrees on this standard way of doing something, you can make all that sort of disappear. Oh, we'll just use the terms that were done for this because we all know what they are. There've been no changes. We vetted that before. And so all we really have to agree on are like, how much is your company worth or how much am I investing? And so therefore, by using existing forms, you can avoid a whole lot of drafting. And because this is not actually the agreement, this is not actually the investment documentation, when you sign a term sheet, it's not legally binding. Remember, it's an agreement to agree. It's an agreement to create an agreement that will absolutely be legally binding on everybody. That being said, although it is not technically legally binding, and typically a full term sheet says this is not legally binding until there are further documents that we all sign to make it so. That being said, a term sheet, if you sign it, has really a lot of moral weight to it. And so if you sign a term sheet agreeing to do a deal at this valuation for this amount under these terms, and then you decide to walk away from that term sheet, whichever side you're on, either the investor or the company, you will immediately get a big black eye on your reputation. And so if an investor walks away from their term sheets, that will quickly circulate among everybody in the industry, and they will know that you can't trust this investor. And similarly, to a slightly lesser extent, but similarly, if you as a founder, sign a term sheet and walk away, you risk having your reputation irrevocably ruined. And that won't necessarily affect any future chance of your getting funded. But for some people, people like me, for example, who hold integrity in very high regard, that would be dispositive if I know that you've walked away from a previous term sheet that you would sign. Okay, so that's what a term sheet is. And therefore, when you're discussing with your potential investor, what terms are in this term sheet, this is a negotiation. And so we have to start with the basis of negotiations. What is this all about? And the key factors, if there are two things that you walk away from on the subject of negotiation, it's alternatives and principles, right? Because this is where all negotiation 
hits the rubber meets the road, right? So the principles are what things are important to you. On what hill will you die? The alternatives are, okay, if not this, then what? What are other alternatives? And you have to look at these things in terms of alternatives and principles from everybody's perspective. You've got to look at it from your perspective and understand, what if I don't get this investment? Okay, will the company go bankrupt? Hmm. What are my principles? Will I sell my soul to keep the company alive? Or is my soul too valuable and I won't sell my soul even if the company goes bankrupt? What are my alternatives for getting funding? Can I fund it out of my credit card? Can I get a friends and family round? You have to understand exactly what all your options are. And then if you're smart, you will think about all the options and alternatives that your investor has. What other companies out there are doing the same kind of things? How broad is their thesis? If they're only looking to invest in a specific kind of company and you were the only one in town and they really need to invest in you, you'll be in a different position of power than if you are just one of a million companies that they are will be looking at. And then you want to look at the market. What is happening around the market? Because that puts the context around the alternatives for both you and your investors. So what are other deals being done? If you come in wildly out of market, the odds are that the investors will look at the same market and say, okay, that just doesn't make sense for me because I can do something else. It gives me more alternatives. So therefore, when you're negotiating this term sheet, the terms of the deal with your investors, you want to focus on interests and not positions. These term sheets, remember, are the summary effectively of big, long pages of documentation. And the fact of the matter is investors have been doing this a whole lot longer than you have. And there's a saying that the devil can quote scripture to his own purposes. And so therefore, if you insist on one particular thing, I must have a valuation of at least you know, $10 million million three hundred and forty two dollars any investor worth their salt and their lawyers can come up with a term sheet for you that will hit exactly that one number if that's what you're focused on but believe me there will be other parts of the documentation other clauses and terms that will get them what they ultimately need so don't focus on specific things focus on your general interests and what you're trying to do and that means if you do it that way everybody will ultimately likely come out ahead and then finally, when you're having a discussion, a negotiation about a term sheet with investors, style counts. If you're a real asshole about it, they'll know if you're hard driving and won't ac accept anything else, won't discuss possibilities of things, they'll know. You may get the deal done, but it'll set the tone for a long-term relationship. And so you want to come across as straightforward, as clear, as a being of high integrity, of being firm, not a pushover. You don't want to come in as a, what I call the Oliver Twist thing. Please, sir, can I have some money? Which would put you one down. You don't, don't want to come across as a master of the universe saying my way or the highway. Um, so style is important. Okay, when we are doing these term sheets, what is the subject? What are the term sheets all about? What are the actual terms in the term sheet? Well, there are two things that are in every investment term sheet. Otherwise, you wouldn't need to have a term sheet, right? Uh, and that is, first of all, how much money is the investor putting in your company? Remember, this is all about an investment deal into your company. And so the goal here is for them to tell you how much they're putting in. And if you decide that's an acceptable amount of money for you to get in here. And then the flip side of that is, okay, they're putting in their money and what are they getting in exchange? How much of the company, what percentage ownership of the company will they ultimately get for that investment? Because that's where they make their money by selling that piece of the deal many years in the future. And so there are a number of ways of deciding what they're going to get for their investment. And this is where term sheets get interesting. Well, the first thing is you can say, okay, here is the valuation of my company. <clears throat> if you're putting in $1 million and that gets you, and, and we say a pre-money valuation of my company is $3 million, then you are getting $3 million worth of the company plus the 1 million you're putting in. So the company's worth $4 million. You're putting in a million. So that means you're going to own 25% of the company. So if you say the valuation of my company is X, 
then that's what you're getting. Very clear for everybody. But often for very early stage startups, it's very difficult to come up with a valuation that both sides can agree on. You as the founder are convinced you're going to be coming up with a unicorn. The investor, somewhat more jaundiced, is saying, oh, you're just a little startup and you got nothing out there to show for it. And so what often happens in early stage deals like this, particularly in the very, very first rounds of funding, the pre-seed round, a seed round, a hustle round, a friends and family round, where nobody's quite sure about the valuation. What you do is you make it explicit in your term sheet or your agreement how you will eventually, at some point in the future, calculate the valuation of the company. And typically, that is based on what somebody else will agree to a valuation of the company in, in the future. Somebody, in theory, who is more experienced, putting in more money, has more to lose in this operation than you. Often, a venture capitalist coming in at a later stage, in the next round, where they're going to have their analysts analyze the whole company and come up with a valuation that the founder will agree on, and that will be the number. And so, therefore, if the investor and the founder can't agree on a number, up front, then what you often do is say, okay, we'll calculate it later based on the next round or a future round with a professional investor deciding what this is worth. And when you say that, then you got to figure out, okay, well, we'll assume the value baseline valuation will come from the next investor, but how does the valuation that I'm going to get relate to that? Well, there are sort of three ways you can figure that out. One way is called the MFN or most favored nation status. And this comes from a diplomatic term where when countries negotiate with each other, um, they can negotiate a term called most favored nation, which means that if we agree to sell you X, Y, or Z, if we sell any other country X, Y, or Z at a better price, you'll get that price. So you will be nobody who will be more favored than you. You will be most favored of all our people. And so therefore, in an MFN agreement, you're saying whatever the next person invests in, whatever valuation the VC comes in at, you'll get the same thing. You'll get the same thing at the same valuation, the same terms as them. But the problem with this is, or the challenge for this for the investor is, the VC isn't coming in now. The VC is coming in in the future. You're coming in now. You, as the early stage investor, are coming in, you know, angels rush in where VCs fear to tread. You're coming in before the VC. So shouldn't you get a little better deal? Well, how do you little get a better deal if you're not going to do the price? Well, you say, okay, I'll get the exact same thing they're having, but I'll pay less than they're paying. And you do that by saying, I'll take the exact same deal that VC is getting, except what I will pay will be at a discount to what they're paying. And typically that discount is about 20% plus or minus. It could be 15%, it could be 25%, but 20% is the typical deal saying, so if they're going to invest at a valuation down the road of $10 million, the, I'll have the exact same terms they have, except the valuation for me will be $8 million when I invest at that point. Oh, huh. okay. You could do that. But the problem with that is if you're investing really early in a company's life cycle and when they get around to doing a priced round, the company is worth a whole lot of money. It's worth $100 million because they managed to get going really fast or use AI or something or other. Well, in that case, if you invested when the company was just starting and really wasn't worth anything like $100 million, and now they're getting their next venture round at $100 million, and you're getting a 20% discount, that would mean as the investor, you're investing at an $80 million valuation, you're getting an $80 million valuation for the investment you're putting in today. Well, that doesn't seem fair. The company really isn't worth $80 million today. So another way of doing things is putting in a valuation cap, which is to say, okay, um, maybe I'll get do the most favored nation or I'll get a discount, but whatever it is, I'll convert in at no greater a valuation than X. Okay, X typically being what we sort of think the company is worth today. And so that means you'll get the same terms as the next investor, but you won't pay any more than this fixed price today. And so when you're setting this valuation, either the valuation cap or the valuation at an explicit set valuation right now, you have to come up with a number between you and the investor. And this is where a lot of companies often fall off the track because if you read the blogs and the breathless things about Elon Musk and the valuations AI companies are getting, you'll think that everybody's doing deals today at $100 million. Or maybe because we're in a current technical slump, it'll be $50 million. But do not believe all the hype. 
these are the actual numbers from last year from the Angel Capital Association, which surveyed all of their members. And it turns out that seed round valuations, which remember are often the second or third round of real valuations out there, are in the range of say four to eight million dollars, not 25 million, 15, 10 million dollars. These are seed round valuations, four to eight. And if you're looking at pre-seed rounds, they're even less. Pre-seed rounds, which might be your hustle round or your friends and family round, might be at a you know two to three to four million valuation, much lower than people often think. So there are a lot of different ways of calculating evaluation. You can't calculate it per se because it doesn't exist. It really, the purpose of evaluation is simply to figure out the percentage of the big future billion dollar outcome that you're, everybody is going to get. And so therefore, since you can't absolutely calculate it, you have to say to guess at it or negotiate at it. And again, investors are looking at the market. They've done a lot of this before, and they have some background that you don't have. One way to look at this, we've actually tried to be helpful here. And so we have been working with companies for 20 years, over thousands, millions, literally, of, of companies. Um, and we put all of our experts to work. And we actually came up with a, a tool, which is one of the, he says modestly, one of the better tools around. It's called the GUST Pre-Money Valuation Report or PMV Report. So this asks you a whole lot of questions about your own company. And at the end, it says, okay, if you're going out for your round right now, the range you should be thinking about is X. And so that's generally a pretty good place to start. It's not guaranteed. We're not investing. It's not the word from God. But compared to any other way of doing things out there, other than just looking at the market and taking a guess, it's going to be a pretty good way to, to start. So before we can get into the actual term sheets itself, there's something else we need to talk about. And that is the concept of an option pool. Because there's a third party in this operation that's not just you and not just the investor. And that is your team, your employees. And equity or ownership of options to buy equity in the company in the future is that's how the team gets compensated for taking the risk of coming to work in your early stage company. So the option pool is a chunk of the ownership of the company that you will set out beforehand, you will agree with your investor beforehand to set aside so that you can issue options to your employees. And typically, when the amount of, of options you set aside is based on where you think the company is going to grow over time, and the time horizon that you look at is until the next major financing round. So if you think you're going to do a financing round within the next you know, two years, um, then the question is going to be, okay, how much in the way of options, how much equity am I going to need to reserve to provide my team over the next two years? I'm going to need a CTO, a CFO, a CMO, whatever. Because the investor who's investing says, well, we all know you're going to need to hire those guys to get you to that next funding round. And I don't want to be diluted by having them around. So let's figure that out now and build that into the agreement. And so therefore, typically these term sheets, either you negotiate or it's baked in already, um, discuss how big the option pool is going to be. And so one of them is how much, per what percentage of the company will be uh, up front, set aside for an option pool. The next is from where it's coming. And the there is an answer to this one. And the answer is it's coming from your share as a company, because the investor, as far as they are concerned, they are investing as fully diluted, assuming that all the options are given out, which you're supposed to do over the next two years or one year, or remember, that's how you're calculating this, however long, they assume that those are going to be given out. So therefore, when they calculate the valuation of your company, they are calculating it based on the assumption of the option plan. And then there are a bunch of other specifics if you get into detailed things about vesting and how long the vesting is. Typically, vesting is very standard. It's for these kinds of startup companies, it's four-year vesting. So the money, the uh, options and equity you get vests over four years with a one-year cliff. So the first year, if you get canned in the first year, you don't get anything. But after you've been there the first year, your whole first year vests, and after that is monthly vesting. So putting all that together, let's take a look at how this all works. And these are some illustrations from a great site called ownyourventure.com, which is a wonderful online visual calculator for free that you can play around with and see what different scenarios will look like. So here, we're going to start with a very basic, simple round. So we'll simple company, simple round, two co-founders. You start out day one, you'd each own half the company. 
but you actually don't because that's not a good idea. A 50-50 split, as we will advise you if you were to ask us, is not a good idea because then you can get, <laughs> thank you, Ryan, then you can get into absolute stasis if you can't agree. Somebody has to have that extra 1%, so the buck has to stop somewhere. So typically there will be a lead founder or the founder who's going to be CEO or whatever, and let's say that person has 51% and the other has 49%. Okay, so now you start the company. There's no value to it right now. You each own half the company. That's fine. You get something going. You begin to develop your product, your MVP. You maybe get some traction. And now you're ready for your first equity round, right? So we're not going to talk about the other ways of doing things with safes and convertible notes and so on and so forth. We'll get to that later. We're now talking about an equity round, a very basic fundamental thing. You're selling part of your company. You're bringing in from an angel investor or a seed fund, this seed financing round. So how much are you gonna raise in this round? Well, let's say you're gonna raise $1 million, okay? And now the big question, the subject for negotiation in the term sheet is, how much of the company are you gonna give up to the investor for to get that $1 million? And the way we calculate that is by the money pre-money evaluation of your company, because that 1 million is part of the denominator, that's the numerator for a denominator, which consists of the full value of the company. So if we say, for example, your company today is worth $3 million and the investor is putting in $1 million, that your pre-money valuation is 3 million. Your post-money valuation after the investor puts their million dollars into your bank account is three plus the one in the bank account or $4 million. So therefore the investor is going to get Four million, uh, a twenty-five percent of this range. But now, remember, we had that option plan. The investor wants to know that, that included in that three million valuation is enough share set aside for your team, the team you're going to have to build over the next several years. And so let's say that you and the investor agree that you're going to need 15% of the company set aside for options for your employees. So now, what does this look like after that? Well, very interesting. Here's you see what the division looks like, right? Your founders still have a majority of the company. You have 15% of the total shares allocated to your option plan. And the investor got exactly what they bargained for, which is 25% of the company because they put in 1 million and the company's post-money valuation is $4 million, okay? So now this is great. So we say after this round, the post-money valuation is $4 million. The company goes out and you do cool things. You take the investor's money and you make the company worth more. And now it's time for another round to raise more money but the company is more valuable than it was when the first investor invested. So let's say that going into this next round, say our series A venture round, we all agree, and you can get the VCs who are coming into this round to agree that, whoa, your company is now worth $8 million. You've doubled the value of what it was at the end of the last round. Oh, okay. Well, if you double the round and you make sure the option pool is still at 15% for the people you're going to need to hire after this round. Oh, what does that mean? Well, look at that. You've now got the company ready to go with a, if you, if you take a look at this, you've got an 11 million post valuation, right? The 8 million you were going in, you raised 3 million at this case, for example, for a, uh, from a new BC and the eight plus three is $11 million which now sets you up for your Series B. So your post money after your Series A was 11 million. Oh, but now you do even better. And so now for your Series, for your, your next level, your Series B, you can say, okay, hey, look at what we've done. We've taken that 11 million and we've almost doubled the value of the company again. Now we're worth 20 million increase the option pool again. Um, and you're raising now say 5 million at that, uh, at that 20 million. So now take a look at the pie. What has happened over those different rounds of financing? Investors have gradually gotten more money in different tranches of investors, and they now actually own 56% of the company. Um, the founders, that's those two people in blue over there, um, currently only own 29% of the company. Um, but you have had the company grow in value to a post money value of $25 million. So therefore, what happens? What does this all mean at the end of the day? Take a look at what has happened over time, right? So we started out with the founders owning 100% of the company, 
but the company was worth zero because it had just started. At the end of these four rounds of financing in those terms, the founders actually now own 29 or 30 percent of the company, but the company itself is worth almost 30 million bucks, right? And so therefore, the founder's equity, even though it's a much smaller percentage, the founder's equity is now worth over $6 million between the two of them. So that's how this stuff typically works. And so therefore, if you were to chart this over the path of a company, here's what a typical funding path might look like for an early stage startup company. So the first cash coming in, as we've discussed many times in previous sessions in this series, the first cash has to come from you. Investors will not put any cash into your company if you have not yourself personally invested a meaningful amount of cash. So the first cash came from you. Now you're going out for outside third-party investors. Well, the first round here is typically what we call a hustle round, or previously known as sort of a friends and family round. Um, this is anybody, you, by hook or by crook, you can get to invest in your company. Typically, you might raise less than half a million bucks over here. Um, you'll take 10 to 20% dilution in of your overall equity in there. Um, we'll discuss the various forms shortly into how you can do this, but typically this will be done on a safe note. Um, and then that preps you for getting your pre-seed round. A pre-seed round is where you begin to actually have people who know what they're doing coming in here. Um, you may be sort of pre-product, but you've got your team, your key team built. Um, you've got some traction you've got from somewhere. Uh, you might raise up to 2 million bucks. It used to be a lot less than that, but now the range for these pre-seed rounds is sort of half a million to 2 million. Um, you'll take another 10 to 20% dilution from of your equity over here. And that will then set you up for what today is known as a seed round. Seed rounds used to be what we used to call hustle rounds. But today, a seed round is in the two to $5 million range. Typically, this will be from serious investors, angel, serious angel investors, or angel groups, or seed funds. Um, this, you know, may be done on a safe, but probably not. We'll discuss why. Um, and this will be a big round with, with the big millions of dollars coming in. And again, another 10 to 25% dilution of your equity. And then ultimately you get to a series A when ultimately in the early stage scenario. Um, and this would be in the, you know, upper millions of single digit millions, or even more than that double digit millions. At this point, you've now got a product and you've gotten real serious traction. The product is scaling, which is what this whole series is about. You typically will be selling your shares now to institutional investors, um, venture capital funds, and the like. And again, you'll be taking another 20% dilution hit on this. So that's what a typical funding path would look like. So now, with all of this as background, <laughs> we've spent half an hour discussing the whys. Now, the what, when you're actually negotiating all of those detailed terms about how the investors will invest, what they get, what you give up, and so on and so forth, um, we come down to the question of what structure, what financing structure will the round use? Where is the money coming from under what kinds of terms, right? So the first way you can get money is somebody gives you money. That's called a grant, and that's like free money. There are ways of getting that. The U.S. government has something called America's Seed Fund. It's the SBIR, STTR program, Small Business Innovation Research Grants, and they literally give you money. And it's surprisingly not too difficult. It's even easier to get money out of them than it is out of angel groups over there, only for certain kinds of companies, but it's possible. When a grant is facing you and you get free money, you will sign what they give you. They say, here's the documentation. There's no negotiation. You apply for the grant and the grantor says, great, take the money. Okay, that's the beginning and end of free money. But if you can't get a grant, then what do you do? Well, you can borrow money, right? And you borrow money, when you borrow money, that's called a loan. Somebody gives you money and then expects you to pay it back with interest. There's only one slight problem with borrowing money for a startup. What do you think happens when you go to a bank, which gives out loans, and you say, hey, I'd like you to loan me money for my startup and I'll pay you back when I become a unicorn. You know what the reaction of the bank is? Right, no, no way, too risky, not my job. Go find somebody else to give you that money because this is really risky because unfortunately, the fact is that a majority of all startups fail, fail completely. And a bank is not in the business of taking risk at all. They are in the business of renting you money, which they charge a little bit of interest. And if you make a billion dollars, that's great. They just want their interest back. But if you fail, 
they want their money back with interest. And if you don't have money to pay for it to return their money, they're not going to be happy. So therefore, you're not going to get loans for your startup unless you personally guarantee it by putting up your house and your car and your children and whatever it is as guarantors. Okay, so if you can't borrow it and nobody's going to give it to you, what is your option? And that's where we get to investors. And there is you have to sell stock in your company. You're selling part of the upside, part of the good big things that will come out in the future in exchange for a share of the pie, in exchange for a share of the ownership. And so now you say, well, that sounds great. Um, I'm going to sell 10% of my company, 25% of my company to an investor. They'll give me the cash. We'll be partners. They'll own the company. And away we go. Fortunately, it doesn't quite work that way for an interesting reason that you probably haven't figured out yet. And I love this cartoon, one of my favorite New Yorker cartoons ever. We've been, these two people are pitching this VC. We've invested our hearts and soul in this company. We're only asking you to invest $10 million. And therein lies the difference. Your heart and soul, as important as it is and as critical to the passion and future of the company as it is, is different from the $10 million because the $10 million is fungible. And that means it can be used for other things like investing in something else or going on a vacation or buying a fancy house or whatever. And so therefore, these two things are different. But let's say that this investor says, okay, what they've built with their heart and soul is an amazingly cool company, and he'll invest $10 million into the company um, for a share of the ownership. Well, that's great. Okay, so now you have the company. He's put in, uh, let's say he's put in $10 million for 10%. So the company is worth $100 million, right? So at that point, he's got his 10 million in cash. They've got their 90 million of heart and soul, and they're heading off to create a whole unicorn, and that's great. And so that's where things go really, really well. The company turns out to be a billion dollar unicorn. It can do it with no additional cash. And what happens? Well, at the end of the day, the company gets sold for a billion dollars and they split the proceeds and the investor gets a hundred million dollars back. Hey, that's really cool. They've done a 10X on their $10 million investment because they got their 10% of the billion dollars. And those guys with their heart and soul, they got the value of all that effort and passion. They got their 90% of the uh, sale price or $900 million and everybody's happy. But what happens if instead of being a billion dollar unicorn, it's actually a $5 million vote anchor? What happens if it didn't really pan out the way everybody expected? And instead of being worth a billion dollars or even a hundred million dollars at which they agreed it was worth the first time around. It really, they just had ended up having an aqua hire and they sold off the patents or they sold off the team and they got 5 million bucks. Well, if the investor had just bought common stock and they were all partners in here, what do you think would happen? <laughs> well, let's see, the investor gets 10% of the 5 million or 500,000. And the guys who just took his $10 million and blew it <laughs> on a company that didn't succeed walk away with four and a half million dollars in cash for their heart and soul. What do you think the investor would think about this scenario? The answer is investors are not particularly happy with this scenario. And that's why investors do not invest in common stock because in good case, it's great. In the bad case, not so great. It's actually very, very bad. So what are the alternatives to common stock? Well, it so happens there's something called preferred stock. And preferred stock, set up by your charter and your Delaware C Corporation, is a special kind of stock that has a couple of interesting things. It gets paid back first until all the cash that was put in to buy that stock gets returned. And so therefore, in the case we just described, if 5 million came back because the investor put in 10 million, all of that 5 million bucks would go to pay off that 10 million bucks to the investor. And if the company were sold for 10 million, it would all still go to the investor. Um, if it was sold for 11 million, well, 10 million would go to the investor. And then that extra million on top would be divided among all the common stockholders over there. Um, so that's one way of doing things. But the problem with that is preferred stock only gets back the amount that was paid for in the first place. So while this would be workable in a bad scenario, as we just discussed, where the investor gets their cash back, in a good scenario, in the billion dollar scenario, the investor wouldn't share in the profits. So that doesn't work really well. Okay, well, how about this? How about we say, let's loan the company money, and we will eventually convert the money 
in the loan into buying equity, shares of stock in the company. Well, that's okay. Um, that's a possibility. There are problems with doing that on the long term. You don't want to have debt on the company's balance sheet forever, and it doesn't give the ability to get the, a lot of the upside there. But that's a way we can get started early on. And that's good for the investor. The problem, however, for the company is, well, a loan, hmm, let's see, if I recall a loan correctly, that means you're borrowing money and I got to pay you back with interest at a certain date. Well, that date is designed to me as this is a short-term loan until you get money, um, you know, from in the next round. So uh, what happens if, if the company really hasn't been successful by then? And what happens if we can't pay the loan back on the maturity date in a year or so? Oh, what happens? Excuse me? The investor can put the company into bankruptcy or can you can use that threat to do whatever they want? Oh, that's not too good for us. That's sort of scary. So therefore, a group of companies, particularly coming out of the YC, um, Y Combinator Accelerator Program, which were very hotshot companies with a lot of investors who want to invest in there, went to YC and said, what do we do about that? And Y Combinator invented something at a whole cloth a number of years ago called a SAFE, S-A-F-E, Simple Agreement for Future Equity. And that looks a lot like a convertible note, a loan that converts into equity, except that it takes out all the bad things, <laughs> the bad things from the point of view of the company that they didn't want. There's no maturity date, so it doesn't have to be paid back by a particular time. There's no interest. There is no, it's not debt. It doesn't show up on your books as debt. Um, hmm. Okay, that's pretty good as far as a company is concerned. So that's okay, fine for an early round. But remember, it's not at this point because it converts to equity later. It's not setting a price and you're not still buying equity in the company. So therefore, what serious investors for big rounds of investments do in a company is they buy something else, another kind of stock. This kind of stock is called convertible preferred stock. And so what this is, is a magic kind of stock. It starts out as preferred stock. So therefore, if the company go, falls on hard times and you have the bad scenario where it only sells for 5 million bucks, investors say, thank you very much. Um, we're going to get all that cash back up to what the amount we, we put in plus dividends and so on. On the other hand, if the company becomes a unicorn and it's great, what happens? Well, in that case, with this convertible preferred stock, the investors can wave their magic wand and say, poof, hey, guess what? Our <laughs> preferred stock just magically converted into common stock, just like the founders. And now we can all share in the good things coming out of common stock for the, for the uh, acquisition we had. So those are the different kinds of structures that you can invest uh, money into a startup company with. And so those are the early, the simple ones are just existing documents. There's nothing to negotiate. They've all been done a million times. And one of the advantages of using these very simple things is you can just sign it, fill in the number, and everybody knows what they are. You don't negotiate it because the reason they're great is because they are pre-negotiated and simple. When you get to the big money, then you're going to use a term sheet to actually discuss what the terms are of this future investment. And so therefore, this is how we get to term sheets. The first thing, most single important rule of term sheets, emblazon this on your mind with a branding iron. You do not want to write your own term sheet. I don't care how smart you are. I don't care if your mother's a lawyer. I don't care if you think you have something that somebody else doesn't have. No, never, ever, ever. Don't even think about making up your own term sheet. Instead, use one of the existing term sheets out there that have been done specifically for this purpose and carefully, carefully negotiated over many years by lots of people. So let's start walking through what these term sheets actually are. So the first one, the easy one, is a safe. This is the originally started by Y Combinator. Um, and just here, we have our own. We adopted a version, uh, as you'll see. Remember, the safe is not a note. It's not a loan, but it's not stock either. It's this magic thing that sort of converts into future equity. And as far as companies are concerned, this is a pretty good way to raise money. You get a lot of the, of the benefits of, of all of the other things in there, and it works to your advantage, right? You get cash in the door now because investors are putting in cash today. It converts to equity later 
on when somebody else sets a price for the company. It doesn't have a maturity date, so it doesn't have to be paid back at a particular point. Um, if you can, company goes out of business, it's not a debt, so it doesn't have to be repaid. It's not on your books as debt. Um, somebody can't own the company because uh, it's not secured, securable debt in there. Um, and surprisingly, over the let, this used to be something that investors would not do. I personally don't really like investing on a safe. Um, but that being said, over the last five to 10 years, it's become much more acceptable to investors. Why? Because it has very similar provisions to a convertible note, which investors will often do. Um, it can be discounted to the next round. It can have a cap. Um, but it's really simple. It's really easy. It's been done enough times. So everybody knows how they work. It doesn't require spending money on lawyer's fees, which of a small investment would take a big chunk. It doesn't require negotiating between the founders and the um, uh, investors. It's a very simple deal. So um, there are a couple of flavors of safe. And let me start you out with the version that we at, at Gust have developed to make things as simple as is humanly possible. So if you want to raise money in your very first round, your hustle round, your friends and family from people you know, people who aren't professional, sophisticated investors, but you want to be sure everything is clean and appropriate and protected and careful, you use the August safe. And so all you have to decide here, how much are they putting in? There's literally one line. <laughs> how much is the investor putting in? And everything else is standardized and taken care of for you. You get all the advantages of a safe and no negotiation involved. For those who want to know what's happening behind the scenes, it's effectively an MFN deal. It's a most favored nation status. So it says your safe investor will get the same terms as the next investor, the VCs who come in later, but they will pay 20% less. They'll get a 20% discount. And the safe will automatically roll up if you do a convertible note financing uh, or another safe later on. They'll automatically roll up and, and magically end up in, this, in the right place for it. So it's brain dead easy. It's really powerful, really simple, and you can do it all on platform with Gust. The other variety of safe, the original version or the original modified version is by Y Combinator. They've changed it a number of times over the years. The current version, I think, is version two, um, which is a called a post money safe. And that has to do with the way you calculate what percentage of the company based on the next purchase price will, will come in. Um, you have to make a couple of decisions here if you're going to use a YC safe, right? And so you have to decide whether... Is it going to be capped? Are you going to put in a, a conversion cap? How much the, the uh, what valuation for your company will be the maximum regardless of what happens in the next round? Or will you do it as a discount uh, the way ours does? And if so, what discount rate are you going to put in? Or are you just going to say it'll convert at the same as the MFN as the next round coming in? And then another thing you have to ask yourself is, should there be a side letter? A side letter is something outside the safe contract. The, the pro rata side letter says that the investor in the safe will have the ability to invest up to the same percentage in the next financing round. So that's a good thing for the investors. Some investors will insist on it. And if you if they want you to put it in, instead of modifying the safe, you will do a side letter over there. Okay, so though, so again, there's no term sheet here because the term sheet is the actual uh, safe document itself. You just fill in the blanks, away you go. There's no nothing else gets negotiated aside from these things that I just discussed, um, and you're all ready to go. However, if you don't do a safe, or if you're dealing with a more sophisticated investor who is insisting on a convertible note, which provides them more protections over the maturity date and interest and a bunch of other provisions over there, um, then remember, a convertible note is a loan, which means it has a maturity date, so it has to be repaid at a particular time. Uh, it is uh, interest-bearing, so you have to pay interest. It's typically accrued and rolled into the equity that they get at the other end, so you don't pay it cash out, but it is accruing. Um, and and if things go south, it's debt. So it gets paid back before anything else other than employee owed salary. So it's a debt on the books of the company. Um, and so you can discount the uh, the loan. Um, you can say it'll be it'll be converted into the next round at a discount, um, but it won't at that point convert into the at the same number. It'll convert into a lesser number. The problem is convertible notes are not a long-term thing. They're designed for a short-term, six months, 12 months, 18, 24 months. 
really shouldn't run a convertible note longer than a couple of years, because at that point, the valuation of the company hopefully has been you know, gone up significantly, and you don't want to get into all kinds of gnarly things that might happen. And so um, what we do at Gust, you, know, you can you can actually combine these two things, right? You can say, I want a convertible note, which will have both a cap and uh, a discount. And what should the amount of the cap on a cap note be? It's not some mythical valuation that the company will be in the future. When you put a cap into a note, that cap should be the valuation of the company today if you were doing a priced round. Because, so that's the answer is not a very high cap because otherwise the investor will end up paying more than they should have paid today if they just invested today. So therefore, um, one way of doing things, many notes done, many convertible notes done by sophisticated investors using their own forms are typically done with a cap and a discount. However, for those folks on the Gus Launch platform, we've actually made it really easy. We've taken the best of all of these convertible notes and given you a very clean and clear way to create a convertible note term sheet. And so in the case of a convertible note, because the documentation is multiple pages, the term sheet is very, very simple. And it basically, the questions you have to answer for yourself with your investor are, how much money is the investor putting in? What is the maturity? How long will this be? And typically 18 months to two years is the typical time for this based on when you think you're going to get to the next round. Remember, the goal here is to convert this in at the next round. What is the interest rate on the note? Typically these days, it's about 5% plus or minus. You know, if it's like 2%, you'll say that's a great deal um, for somebody, not for the company, not the investor. And if it has 10 or 20%, mm, that gets to be usurious. So roughly 5%, but you can choose the, you know, the interest rate. And then what will trigger the conversion of the convertible note into the next round? So typically they're only converted when you do a full on next round and an equity round at a, where you're raise a specific amount of money. And so that's the, what's called the conversion trigger, how much you have to raise. And then finally, you go to decide, okay, what is the cap for the uh, for this round? How much will like, the maximum will convert at valuation? Or what is the discount to what the next person is paying? Or both. You can do a, a cap and a discount. And that's this convertible note. You can do it totally on platform. It's a very cool way of doing things that will automatically roll up the previous uh, Gus safes uh, and the like. Okay. So far, we haven't done much in the way of term sheets, but we've done this is how deals get done. So now we're finally getting to the thing where you really need a term sheet. And so this is when you have convertible preferred stock. So now you're actually, the investor is buying stock in the company and all the rubber meets the road, all those things, those hundred pages of documentation over there, um, you know, come into play. And so now this is the best of both worlds for an investor. And this, by the way, is where all early stage investments ultimately end up because everything else, um, safes and convertible convertible notes all end up converting into convertible preferred stock. So, you know, a couple of years, two, three, four years after a company has done its very first pre-seed or, or hustle round, everybody will be with convertible stock. And so convertible preferred stock. And so this provides good upside and downside protection for the investors. Upside, they convert to, to common. Downside, they keep it as preferred. Um, it tends to be a little more complex if you were negotiating one from scratch, you know, you know, 10K or more in legal fees if you were to do it from scratch. Um, we have a way to do it a little less than that. Um, but all serious VC deals are going to be using this kind of stuff. On the other hand, this is not bad for the company. This is good for the company because this is the way all deals are done. It strengthens your balance sheet. You have no debt or outstanding obligations. It doesn't get paid back because it is investment in equity in the company. It allows for multiple rounds of the company, um, and there are existing standardized term sheets um, for, for doing this. Um, and one of the questions is, when does it convert into prefer into common stock? Remember, this is convertible preferred stock, which magically can convert into common. And typically, it converts into common either at an IPO, when if you go public, then all the stock converts, um, and away you go. Everybody has the same kind of stock or a majority of the holders of this convertible preferred stock can choose to convert it into common. Um, and so that only happens when things go sort of gnarling and you're doing a cram down round or things like that. 
Um, so again, we've made things really easy with Gus. We have our uh, series seed documents. So this is a version of a standard convertible preferred round designed to make it easy and simple and, and take a lot of the negotiation out of it, right? And so the questions you're going to be making here, asking for here are, how much is the investor putting in? How much is being raised totally in this round from this and other investors? What's the minimum and maximum in order for the round to close? What's the valuation? Because remember, this is known as a priced round. So you have to decide how much it is. What's the dividend rate for the that's being paid or accrued on the preferred stock? Sort of like interest. Um, the investors are going to want to have their lawyers look at this and they're going to want you to cover the cost. So how much are you going to allow out of the closing to pay the investors' lawyers? It's typically about 5,000 bucks, but it could be more. Um, okay, really important. What's the board composition going to be? This is now we're now all partners here. We're now investing in equity. So the board of directors, we're going to have a shareholders agreement. And who's going to get to appoint the board? Only the founder, only the investors, one seat for each. Um, there are, we've done a very simple one, which says a founder, board representative, an investor representative, a third party outside one that everybody agrees on. I'm giving you a term sheet, which is an agreement to agree. Uh, and so for how long um, after you sign this thing, will you agree not to talk to anybody else while we actually get to the real agreement? That's called the no shop period. And that's pretty important. And then finally, how long is this offer good for? What investors don't want is for you to take a term sheet from me and then walk around to every other investor in town and say, hey, I got a term sheet from David over here. Can you do better? Why do I want to encourage you to get a better deal out there, right? So therefore, typically, term sheets will come for an equity round with a pretty short time frame. You have like 24 or 48 hours to decide whether you want to take me or not. So you're not going to go out and, uh, and shop this there. And so we make this really easy with the Gust series seed round. And again, one of the features of this is this ends up when you do another future round of full on heavy duty series A round, for example, um, this will the investors in this round will get the same protections as the investor in the next round. And so now finally, to wrap up where this has all been leading to, which is if you're doing a full venture capital around a series A or a series B using full on traditional industry documentation, this is done using standard set of documents from the National Venture Capital Association known as the NVCA. And this is what is invariably used for every deal over five or 10 million bucks. Um, this was developed over 20 years by all the lawyers for all the big companies and the investors. So from both sides, they make it freely available. There are lots of pieces and components to it. There are half a dozen different documents from uh, shareholders agreements to uh, purchase and sale agreements to uh, stock certificates, all that kind of stuff. There are all kinds of things that both sides have to agree on, which is why you're going to have a term sheet to do it. And so just to give you an idea of where this is all heading, <laughs> here are some of the things that you will have to discuss with your investor and your lawyer when you're negotiating a full on round, including not only things like the investment amount, the size, the valuation, and so on and so forth, also things like anti-dilution protection, voting rights, board control, protective provisions for investors, pro rata rights, key man insurance, right of first refusal and co-sale, what preemptive rights do they have, what kinds of, uh, of um, you know, uh, pro rata rights in, in future things. Um, how long is the mandatory, you know, what mandatory conversion provisions are there for when it has to convert into common stock? What happens if there is a pay to play round and a, a future round? Does everybody have to convert or what happens if they don't? Um, what happens in terms of information? What are they entitled to in terms of, of financials and information rights about what's happening in the company? When can they sell their shares on their own without you getting involved? What kind of non-competition things do they require? All these kinds of stuff are negotiated as part of an NBCA term sheet negotiation, which is where you absolutely, positively, no question, need to have a lawyer who knows this stuff to help you do this over there. And so finally, I will give you the big takeaways for negotiating a term sheet, right? One, in this round, it's ultimately going to be the investor who calls the shots on what type of deal you have. Some investors will not do safes. Some investors want to go right to a priced equity round. Most investors will do a convertible note or a safe for the early rounds on there. But whatever they're willing to do, if they're willing to put cash in, you typically will take that, right? Um, when somebody says, what's your valuation? If you say our valuation is $8 million, well, if you don't have a signed term sheet from another investor saying they're going to give you money at an $8 million valuation, 
you don't have a valuation. It's up for discussion. <laughs> it's negotiable. Keep in mind about that, right? When you set your valuation, be very clear about that you know what's happening in the market. I showed you some numbers before. Be very clear and, and understand what else is happening out there and don't be greedy. Better to have, as you saw, you know, 30% of a $25 million company than 100% of a $0 company over there, right? Luckily, safes and the convertible notes that we've got on the Gus platform are all designed to be done without lawyers because they've been looked at by many, many lawyers and are totally standard, which is why you don't change them. And so that's fine. Doesn't require a lawyer. The minute you get into convertible note territory and absolutely positively, when you're doing a full price round, you want to have a lawyer who can help you work through and advise you on what's going on. Ultimately, when you negotiate a term sheet, make sure you know your bottom line. What will walk away? Are you prepared to sell your soul? Um, if you can't do a deal, when are you going to try and bootstrap it yourself? Um, really, really important. And finally, in case I hadn't mentioned it before, do not write your own term sheet. Use one of the models that we've discussed. Um, so for more information, there's tons of stuff out there. I've written a fair amount about this in the Startup Checklist, my New York Times bestselling book uh, about how to do a, a scalable company. Uh, and the classic book here is a great book by our friend Brad Feld um, and Jason Mendelson from the founders of Techstars called Venture Deals, How to Be Smarter Than Your Lawyer and Venture Capitalist, which walks you through all of the various things. And this is probably most appropriate when you're negotiating negotiating a full-on NBCA uh, series term sheet over there. So that's it. Hope you found this really helpful. Uh, as always, there's lots of stuff online here, lots of links to tools that Gust has, to my books, various background things over here. Uh, and um, at this point, we're going to be happy to end this session. And for those who are still online with us, we will be delighted to take some questions. Thank you. Holy crap. <laughs> we started two minutes late and you literally got that down to, I'm going to say that was a perfect 60 minutes. <laughs> Thank you so much, David. Uh, what a lot of ground to cover. And I have been, I didn't interrupt you at all because you were going at a great pace. And I was just trying to tackle as many questions in the chat as possible for the relevant things, because it seemed like you really had that one honed in. But if we have a little time for some q and I'll throw some of the more uh, specific ones. Shoot. Um, I'm fighting the C Corp uh, S Corp LLC battle in the chat, but I'm going to leave that one. Oh, look at the, you're getting some claps over here. This is, we're streaming Twitch right now. All right. Uh, going all the way back to uh, valuation when you started it out. Uh, is there, is an informal valuation good enough at that stage or should we get a form of valuation? I handled a little bit of this in the chat with foreign NAs and the clarity, but I think, right. yeah, lay it out. So the, the answer is there is no such thing as a formal valuation for a startup company. What you may have heard about is something called a foreign and a valuation, and that is something completely separate that is used for option plans that is used for issuing options. A foreign and a valuation is what common stock in the company is worth. But as we just discussed, investors aren't buying common stock, right? They're either putting in a, a loan money in a safe or a note, or they're buying convertible preferred stock um, in an equity round. They're not buying common stock. So, the, so a foreign and a valuation has nothing to do with that. Therefore, you're talking about the money you're going to take in for a safe or a convertible note or even a priced equity round. Nobody can give you a valuation because your company isn't worth whatever the valuation would be. Literally, <laughs> if you would take whatever the valuation they're offering is there, you should go home because that's not what it's about. The whole purpose of this is to just adjust the percentages that you'll have of the unicorn in the future. So no, do not get a valuation. The closest you should come to that is the Gust valuation tool, which will give you a rough idea of where you're going. So effectively, this is a negotiation. And by the way, what if you had a valuation? If you got somebody to give you a valuation? Well, if that person's not writing you a check, that's what the paper is written on. Why is an investor going to say, I'll give you that valuation? They're not. For, for investors who know what they're doing, they'll give you an evaluation. For investors who don't know what they're doing, they should use one of the safer convertible note term sheets that push off the valuation to somebody else down the road. Yeah, I would say the closest thing to an informal valuation is those convertible instruments because they're not saying this company is worth this right now, but they're saying if I put money into this company, there's a cap on how big the company can be and I will get, you know, that kind of thing. That's the closest thing I would think to an informal one. And I love that point that <laughs> if it's somebody who's not doing the investing, whatever. I know there's a lot of businesses out there that sell valuations. They have complex algorithms. Do not, do like that. not get a valuation for your startup company. It makes no sense. It will do you zero good. Nobody will look at it. Nobody will rely on it. And it will just make you look like an 
not an idiot. It'll make you look naive. It Let's looks it yeah, very if you naive. Go, if, if you, you come in and be like, but this company said I'm worth five million dollars. Right? Yeah. Even even if you, even if you take your gust valuation um, to a VC and say, hey, the gust says it's this. Now I'll tell you, they're pretty good valuations, and therefore, and they were designed as a as a rational starting point for you dealing for what you should be asking for generally, right? But again, we're not investing in your company, so it's not God's word, and do not get a valuation. There's no such thing. I love it. And I will say our valuation tool does cost $19 and we are not a valuations company. We've built that based on statistics from thousands of companies that have gone through 49A valuations and funding rounds on our platform. We charge the $19 to only sell it to startups who are serious and also so that people don't try to like game and reverse engineer and do all the kind of stuff like that. We are not saying that this is your valuation. We're just giving you a range based on common statistics, location, and information about your traction so far. It is for you it is not for an investor. If you go to an investor with your pre-money valuation Gus report and say, look how much Gus thinks I'm worth, they will consider you naive. It's really just to, to give you an idea and kind of a sober take on, because things are usually always lower than people want them to be. Um, I have a great one uh, that comes up. Mohan, how does a safe show up on your balance sheet? <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't. Um, if you recall you probably didn't recall because it was one little easter egg hidden in there but if you look when i when i said that here are the, the the four term sheets and i said a safe and you know there's debt for for a loan convertible note and equity for a seed round and if you looked at what i had next to a safe it was actually a very interesting symbol and that was the the symbol of the yuz from on beyond zebra dr seuss the answer is it is nothing it is not it is not debt it is not equity it is a magical thing um that does not show up in your balance sheet per se but it but it does show up on your overall financials as we have a you know outstanding yeah. safe so this stuff will convert into our, our deal and so basically when investors are looking at the percentages they get when any percentage any investor is looking at a percentage they will look on it and look at it as what is known as a fully diluted basis so therefore they will say okay what percentage of the company will i own after everything you've committed to has been played out and that includes the safe. So um, you can't hide it, but it doesn't show up technically on your balance sheet. Excellent. John Bauman, who has met you before, David, and actually went through one of your pitch workshops. Uh, John, I will get to your questions because they were early on. There's just a lot I have to read and digest. So do not think I'm looking over you, but we will get there. Um, we've got David Cannon. He's got an old company. He's 26 years old. He's rebooting the whole brand. He has 19 friends and family shareholders. Uh, why can't him and all his shareholders simply just take dilution for each round, anticipating that the risk is diminished and larger funds are invested? Why can't you take dilution for each round? Larger. I'm not quite sure what you're asking there, right? So the bottom line is you have shareholders. And in theory, they assuming they the question is what do they own, right? So if they if if your friends and family round was done on common stock, they own common stock. When you sell more stock, they'll get diluted. If it was a all done on a convertible note or a safe that will convert at the future point, then it doesn't matter what happened in the past, they'll convert that amount of money will convert into the future. So it really depends on specifics of the situation. Yeah, David, if you can provide a little bit more context than that, too. I will say the one thing is you will if you raise funds, you and all your existing shareholders should expect to get diluted. That is how the whole system works. Oh, like if, that, if that's that the slide. question, yes, everybody, as I that's why I walked you all through the um, the dilution over time, right? Everybody gets diluted. There is no such thing as non-dilutable equity, not for you as the founder, not for your first friends and family around, not anybody. The absolute, absolute most you'll ever see is in the case of some accelerators where they will commit to investing in your next round and they, they will get a percentage based on what the next round is. But beyond that, there is no such thing as non-dilutable. So don't even try to go there. Everybody yeah. gets diluted. That's the essence of it. Yeah, David, add some context. It's all common stock. So I think this is a scenario where you might have fallen out of the realm of what David and I have been talking as, as startups, high growth companies, usually early stage companies that are a couple years old that are raising with these instruments. There's a whole class of companies, Delaware C Corps that have, you know, revenue generating businesses that might be decades old that can sell common stock for investment, but it's usually completely different than the economics we're talking about. There's things called subscriber agreements. You work with a lawyer who understands your situation. If you're like a revenue positive or profitable company, you can sometimes get people on your cap table and do things like that. 
but that's not our domain. That's usually things where there's like physical products involved or warehouses or something like that. Those aren't the companies that should be using convertible notes or creating preferred stocks or something like that. So, sorry. So, 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 so ultimately, if you have you have investors, they have purchased uh, you know stock and they own a percentage of the company. And so the question then is, they like you will get diluted when additional cash comes in. Period. Yeah. And they'll have voting rights for that kind of stuff too, depending yeah. on all the things like that. Cool. All right. Uh, this is a classic question. It came up in multiple formats. I have an anonymous one, but I could give it to credit to other people. Uh, pre-revenue, the pre-revenue companies seem to all want money to create their MVP, while almost everybody in the space is saying go-to-market should already be done. Is it realistic to fundraise for a pre-revenue company, uh, specifically thinking of health tech companies, which I know have a bit of bigger barriers, but this question comes up all the time, David. Is it realistic to fundraise a pre-revenue company? The, the answer is, you know, I've been starting companies since I was six years old and I've been investing in companies for 40 years thereabouts. Um, and things have changed. It used to take a lot of money to start a company. You had to create a whole company. None of these things we've been talking about today existed. There were no accelerators. There were no entrepreneurship programs. There was no gust. Um, and so, and if you had to build a physical product or hire lots of people to code something, it cost a lot of money. And so that was one thing that you would have to effectively get money. You'd write a big business plan, typically a 20, 30, 40 page plan showing exactly how you use the money and build this for the whole project. And you would raise money to, to fund that business plan. What has happened over the last several decades is with the accelerating pace of technological change is that it is now much easier to start a company. And this is particularly true of cases these days with things like AI, where you can get a company, if you're not building a large language model, you can get a company started really, really rapidly with a little bit of cash. And so therefore, if you think about the number of companies that are out there doing things and the number of options that an investor has, there are a lot of options. So think about just what we have on Gus today. On Gus today, we have about 1.5 million companies who have created profiles on Gust seeking investment from angel investors. Do you think that um, out of those 1.5 million companies, there are nobody else doing something similar to what you're doing over there, right? So it's so the answer is investors will look typically at an angel investors, one out of 40 companies before they make an investment. VCs will look at one out of 400 companies. And so if you were to line up 40 companies or the 400 people on this call today and say, okay, I got to only pick one of these. Would you pick the one that hasn't yet uh, got his, you know, go to market product done, <laughs> or you pick the one that actually has a product and has some traction and has some revenue. And so that sounds like a catch 22 and it sounds tough. But again, going back to my very first point in this uh, session today, these are not Santa Claus. They're not your parents. They're not angels. They are here to make money. And if they have a choice of making money between investing in somebody with traction and somebody without traction, they'll go with the traction because that's some kind of proof point, some kind of validation. And so the answer is the people who get funded, the companies that manage to make it through are the ones with founders who somehow, some way manage to just push it through. They will do it themselves. They will convince co-founders. They will get strategic partners. They will whatever they got to do to get it done, to get to the point where they are fundable. And I, I know it sounds awful and it sounds nasty and it sounds tough, but that's why only two and a half percent of companies that are started manage to get angel funding and 0.25% get venture funding. That's the way it is. Yep. And that's often very with professional funding. We like to say there's no dead ends. There's only detours. There's stuff that you can do, but that stuff that you can do is not just keep asking for money. It's maybe investigate an accelerator that has targeting pre-revenue. Maybe you'll have to pay for it. And it's just a means to grow your network and actually get you know, your product over the line, putting your own money in you know, a hustle round, as David said. So there are options out there, but just don't be dissuaded if you go and try to pitch New York Angels and they want to pass the profitability in 48 months and you're, or 24 months and you're being like, but I haven't even built my product yet. It's like, that's not who they invest in. Find somebody who, who does you know, earlier or figure it out on your own. Uh, so John Bauman, you might recognize him. He says he, I think, pitched you almost, almost a decade ago when you were chairman of the New York Angels, and he knows Howard Morgan as a mentor. So you might remember cool. him. Yep. Uh, and this might help. Uh, I might butcher this question, but, and this is funny to our conversation before about a convertible note without anything on it. So they negotiated, it sounds like years ago, a convertible debt without a valuation cap with accredited investors, put over $3 million in a project. It was space adjacent, something to do with the International Space Station. 
And now they're trying to communicate the disconnect of their valuation when going out to another funding round because such favorable terms in that initial investment and the size of the investment. Is that anything, is there let's, a disconnect? Let, let, let's, let's, hold on, let's think this through for a second. You put in $3 million, you got $3 million in in convertible debt with no cap a valuation cap. Okay, so therefore, the is the is the how do you communicate that disconnect to who to the next the the next va next investors? You've yep. got it. The, the answer is these guys invested early on. That that's one of the reasons. By the way, remember I, I said you don't want to keep your convertible note outstanding for a uh, long time. This is exactly one of the reasons. And this why was their money. It's not investors' money. They put their own money into this on a convertible debt instrument. Right. So so the the. No, the, the, he's got an accredited investor, angels who are accredited investors. Um, Hang on, I'll, I'll, I'll bring him up here so you can explain it. Yeah, there okay. Oh, look, space. Hi, David. Forgive me. Uh, I just moved today, so I'm not going to go on. Um, no, no problem. Yeah. Just quickly explain what, what the situation is. So we put in uh, probably about $2 million in cash and didn't take salaries for six years. And uh, my first investment was three years ago, and I have between uh, a crowdfunding round, where it shouldn't have been that, but and angels about seven hundred thousand dollars put in, and on the uh, angels that invested about three hundred and sixty-three thousand dollars, they got a discount on the crowdfunding round because they were putting in more money, and um, but I didn't put a cap, so I gave discounts on the crowdfunding valuation. And now I'm going out for a Series A, but you know, we're on the International Space Station of Airbus as a partner. It's a serious business, but based on our milestones, you would think that we're worth, you know, sixty million dollars. Someone who, who's going to just get to a Series A will probably laugh in my face. But we've done the, the milestones because of self-funding and no salaries and and the angel investments. We've only taken in about a million and a half dollars to get this. Which is fine, which is great, which according to Jason Lemkin, skipping around like that is the way you you get real value, right? Both for investors and for founders. And so the answer is that's fine. So the important thing to understand, and this is true for everybody on the call, the important thing to understand is there's no magic that says you have to do a series C and a series A and a this and a that at these numbers and stuff, right? The bottom line is investors are rational business people. They will invest at whatever they believe your valuation is. So if your valuation is... You think the valuation is sixty million dollars? Then, as far as the investors are concerned, they will invest at a, if they agree, a sixty million dollar valuation. It doesn't whether matter whether you call it a Series C or a Series C or a man of the moon. If the if they're talking about buying for you know convertible preferred equity with you at a sixty million dollar valuation, that's what they're going to do. The important thing to understand is they, and that's why I went through that whole option thing, they are buying at a $60 million valuation for you, pre-money valuation, as fully diluted, which means that let's say they are putting in, um, you know, $20 million, right? So they're going to put in $20 million at a $60 million pre-money valuation. At the end of the day, therefore, after post money, they're going to own 20 80ths, 60 plus 20, so one fourth, right? So they're putting in $20 million and buying 25% of the company. Got that? So that's that's what they well, are my, thinking. My, my question was, am I going to get creamed if there isn't a cap on a convertible note? Because Space Florida looks like they could put money no, no, in. No, no, and, no, 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 but no, the bigger wait, investors seem to want to cap. And I've, John, I've, John, yeah. listen to me. Listen to what I'm I'm saying. Listening. If the if the next guy forget what the past is, one th step at a time. If the the new investors believe you're worth sixty million dollars, and they're going to put in say twenty million, they get twenty five percent of the company for their eighty million dollars. There's no creaming anybody in there, right? That is what it is, right? And so the so therefore that sixty million valuation that they are investing includes everybody. It includes you, the cash you put in, it includes your crowd funders, it includes your special crowd funders, you know, and so you do the math to figure out what that looks like, right? And whatever that is. So if so effectively, if you're, uh, you know, so what, what you said there was no cap on the valuation for your- Well, that was for the convertible notes. Now I have investors coming in like a half a million they're looking to do. But that's so fine. But, but are they coming in at, a, I, I assume it's a discount if there's no cap, is there a discount? I'm just starting those discussions from okay. the introduction. Back up. 
who do you think who do you think you have a problem with? I had one guy a year ago that wanted him to 250, but he had a, a lawyer from Tuscaloosa, Alabama, who didn't seem very good. I gave him a great deal, but he complained there was no cap and he, he convinced the investor to pull out. OK, fine. So so what? OK, that's it. So but the bottom line is, if your your question is, if your question is the future, then you have all the existing stuff that we just talked about, about caps and discounts. And but in theory, if you're really raising a 60 million dollar valuation, it's a preferred round. No, it, it's going to be a price. Yeah, I, round. Think that's, I think that's the okay. issue is right now. You can only raise uncapped if you have to raise any more bridge financing. But you're probably going to want to do a preferred investors who would give you enough money to justify a round happening are going to insist on preferred stock for that round. That's fine. Thank you. I'm sorry. Okay. So no, no problem. <laughs> My pleasure. By the way, you look amazing. Even from 15 years ago, was you look better now? I don't know what you do, but you're amazing. Good, ge good genes. Good genes. <laughs> Lost weight. You look fantastic. <laughs> Thank you much, Lee. Appreciate that. All right. Thank you, John. Right, thanks questions. for filling that out. All right. We got some good. Uh, this is a fun one. Uh, Michael Daly asks, I hope you're still here. Can a round mix investment types, safes, convertible notes, equity, warrants? The answer is, listen, anything can be done with enough lawyers and introducing enough complexity into the operation. It typically does not make sense. And there are there are all kinds of reasons why it shouldn't be done. And I will tell you, a priori, the reasons why it shouldn't be done are better than the reasons why it should be done. That being said, if you're going to do it, the one thing that is set up to do it that way is actually Gust. We have developed a, a platform with Gust Launch that is designed to let you raise your first cash from a safe as we discussed, a very simple safe. It's an, effectively an, an MFN. So it just says how much you're putting in and it's designed for your first dollars in from people, from friends and family, people who aren't putting in millions of dollars, people who may not be sophisticated. You may not know what your valuation should be now. That's fine. It lets you take that cash in. And then if you do a convertible note, let's say you have more sophisticated investors a year or two later, six months later, or even at the same time, you know, who are coming in and saying, okay, here's that we want to have a cap or evaluation they negotiated, then the safe will roll into that. And then if you do an actual price round with down the road after that, with people who are saying, here's an equity round, so on and so forth, then all of the preceding stuff, the safes, the convertible notes will automatically roll up into your, your preferred round. And that's, that's the best way to do it. But there is generally no good reason at all to do one for the other. And typically, if if you if you are think you have a reason for why you want to do mix and match within a, a round, that typically means that somebody in there is insisting on a either a better deal or a more advanced deal. There, it's an investor who's insisting on a convertible note as opposed to a safe, or insisting on a price round as opposed to a note. And basically, if that sophisticated person is calling the shots on this, then in fairness, you really should let all the other investors who came in without that sophistication take advantage of this by converting up, rolling it up into an MFN. Excellent. Uh, we had some stuff going on in the chat right near the end, uh, but the <laughs> in danger of you and I both being succinct about this topic. But what about LLCs and raising funds into LLCs and then later converting them to Delaware C Corp? Bad idea. Bad <laughs> idea. <laughs> but LLCs are effectively partnerships and LLCs are not standardized and LLCs have no shares of stock. Um, and so therefore, none of the things that investors, you can't, because there are no shares of stock, you can't provide options to your employees. So all of a sudden you're saying there's no equity, you know, for our employees. Um, you have, uh, because there, I mean, it, the bottom line is an LLC is great if you are running a business yourself or you and a partner and you're not planning to get outside capital. If you are planning to either issue equity to your employees or raise outside capital from investors or make get a really big scalable company which will be worth millions of dollars in those three cases absolutely positively you need to um, be a c corporation and if you're a c corporation you really should be in delaware so if you have already started by incorporating as an llc and you are trying to raise money from investors stop right now <laughs> call Gust um, and see if we can convert you into a Delaware C Corp, either that or abandon your existing LLC and start from fresh as a, as a C Corp because trying, because the answer is yes, you can always convert from an LLC to a C Corp. The problem is the costs. 
And the costs can be at a minimum. If you've done absolutely nothing so far, we can probably do it for cheap for a thousand bucks, something like that. Um, yeah. If on the other hand, you've done anything like you've got investors, you've issued op phantom options or something like that, the numbers skyrocket. And to the point where I personally know of several cases I've been in where they took a longstanding LLC, like a 10 year LLC, which had been done as LLC for sort of good reasons, but now they needed to convert to a C Corp. It cost $150,000 in legal fees alone to handle the base conversion. You do not want that. There is no reason, absolutely none. Start from a C Corp and take it from there. Excellent. All right. Um, this is a little afield, uh, but, and I know this isn't necessarily your space, but this comes up a lot, is early stage pharmaceutical startups and fundraising. These are companies that sometimes never even make revenue before they actually get acquired or something like early, that. Early stage that. pharmaceutical things are, and drug discovery is a very interesting thing. It, it doesn't hit the metrics of a typical standard venture back, you know, angel back startup. Um, but there are a lot of people who invest in there because the returns can be very, very big. Essentially, for those who aren't in the uh, in the in the universe, what happens there is you spend your money up front, very risky money, to get to something where it can pass sort of the first level of trials, the first level of showing that it has promise. And because there are so few things out of all the people who try things that have promise, the few things that actually show they have promise, the minute you can show that, Big Pharma comes in and says, oh, we'll give you a hundred million bucks to go do all of the the uh, you know, the lab work and everything else at, at you know um at, at big valuations. And so the the answer is um it's high risk because it doesn't grow linearly, it grows sort of exponentially. Um and it's a it's a mannequin thing, it's good or bad, boom. Uh and so, but the but again, the answer is there are people who invest in that there are a lot of investors it's one of the biggest areas investing in life sciences and they know exactly what the deal is and they know and so you need to be looking at those people and you need to need to get their feedback and if they tell you that you know uh, no you need to be farther then the answer is you need to be farther so as long as you're talking to the right investors who invest in that as their investing area there are there are standard metrics for what people expect to see at different funding levels but they're not what you would expect to have in a typical web startup awesome and i, I actually thought of one last thing about the llc to c corp because i know we're going to get uh, election questions too is like David's talking about, this is like a completely different realm of running a business and you will get lawyers and we are not lawyers. David and I are not lawyers. We're not accountants, um, but we work in a very specific niche of industry and you will get lawyers who righteously say like, no, you should be an LLC. It's just cheaper. It's just easier. It's just this and that. And they are not wrong. I was, what I like to say is it's correct, but irrelevant advice based on where your company's going. So if you hear kind of advice out there from somebody who's only really done small businesses and things like that, they are using exactly their expertise and what they know to provide you simple recommendations. But if you really do your research and you will find like, we are not anti-lawyer, we actually have a whole raft of lawyers on our platform that help out our startups, but they are lawyers that are familiar with startup businesses, high tech companies, growth oriented companies, which is just sometimes a different body of law. So you might hear conflicting information from experts out in the space but really figuring out what kind of venture you're actually launching and what sort of sets of laws appeals to that and norms is really in your best interest when starting something new. All right, uh, this is a great one. Uh, I'm gonna revisit Mohan's because they added clarity. So if, <laughs> if a safe doesn't show up on the balance sheet, where does the cash show up? Well, first it shows up in your bank account. <laughs> Right. But then... <laughs> so so I, I was being slightly facetious, right? And but the, the answer is yes, it does. I mean, it, it doesn't, it's not like magic money that, that you know goes into your pocket and nobody ever sees. I um, mean, it's there, it's basically shown on it's not a on a traditional balance sheet. Um, your liabilities. But it, but it's your accountants will know where to put it. So in other words, when anybody looks at your financials, they will see it as if it is on your balance sheet, but it's not money owned to the company and it's not a debt that you repay yeah. because it is this weird thing. Um, it doesn't fall into typical accounting kinds of things, but it is actually accounted for. Yeah. Convertible notes do show up as debt, I believe. Convertible, convertible notes are absolutely debt. Yeah, yeah. they show up as debt. Uh, here's a fantastic one returning to uh, entity types. Um, the recommended amount of shares an early stage startup should authorize. 
Oh, so the answer is, again, there's no definitive. It should be 17, right? At, at Gust, when we incorporate you through Gust Launch, we strongly suggest that you authorize 10 million shares. And the reason for that is not that you're going to issue 10 million shares immediately, not that it's worth a gazillion dollars, but 10 million shares is a rational number that lets you divide it into small pieces, right? So for example, if you have, you're providing equity to all of your employees and you're, you're giving everybody options and you have a... You know, we used to say receptionists, but there are no more receptionists. If you have, you know, somebody who's who's doing whatever they're doing, your your robot handler or something who works, you know, an hour a week, and you want to provide them with equity, you may want to give them, you know, zero point, you know, zero one percent or whatever is of equity because uh, everybody should have some equity in there. But in that particular case, if you only had you know, a thousand shares and you're trying to give them 0.01%, you couldn't you have to give them fractional shares, which wouldn't work, right? So 10 million shares means that when you divide it out, there's enough flexibility mathematically to give people whole numbers of shares and let you divide things into appropriate numbers. And so typically what we suggest is you authorize 10 million shares. And if you, you know, as the founders, you'll, you know, authorize for yourself, you'll, you'll, you'll distribute to yourself something plus or minus 6 million shares, give or take maybe a little more than that. And so that then leaves you unallocated you know, shares that you can use for investors to coming in without having, you mean at any point you can add more shares. Remember, it doesn't matter how many shares you have, they all add up to hundred. Definitionally, whatever shares you have, the total of them is hundred percent. And so if you start off with, with 10 million, that's hundred percent. And if you need, later add, you need, need to add another 5 million, that'll still be hundred percent. And so you can always add more. It just requires refund use of incorporation with Delaware and recalculating a bunch of stuff so 10 million is a pretty nice, you know, even number to do it, to make life easy on you. Awesome. And like you said, Gus Launch starts you out with 10 million, helps you with all that early grant stuff. Um, returning to any types, I threw your blog post in there about LLCs, uh, S-Corps, and C-Corp elections. People have heard about this mythical beast of the S-Corp or the S-Corp election. How does that play in with this LLC and C-Corp? So basically, and basically, a corporation is a corporation, and the limited liability company is something else, right? So the, different, the primary difference is LLC, limited liability company, and a corporation. There are multiple flavors of corporations. For, there's a B Corp. A B Corp is a benefit corporation, which looks just like a C corporation, typical corporation, except that it has an overlay of, of you know, social benefit in there. Um, a, and an S Corp is, again, the same exact thing as a C Corp. The only difference is it's an election you're making for tax purposes that says, I will, we will disregard this and because I own the whole company, so we will just pass through all the profit or loss from this company to me. So so in that sense, an S corp election is fine. Uh, you can establish yourself as a corporation. Uh, you know, file an S corp election. You, you'll get to take the you know, stuff off of your um, your taxes. But when you think about it, and if you talk to a smart lawyer, there really isn't a good reason for doing that because the only reason you would want it as an as an S corp as a as a pass through is so you can deduct the, the expenses and you know the the write offs on your own taxes. However. What you lose by doing that is you lose investing into a C corp, um, and and if you want the QSBS tax exemption, which is for qualified small business exemptions, which if you become a unicorn can save you gazillions of dollars, literally tens of millions of dollars. That only starts when you're only owning a C corp share, not S corp share. Number one, uh, and number two, you you by putting things, passing things through to you, you're not accruing any benefits to the company itself. You're just taking them yourself. So if you're smart enough to, to want to use it for tax purposes to write things off, you're probably smart enough to realize that the long term, you're better off being a C-Corp. But if you get, but so create, you know, establish yourself as a corporation and then talk to your accountant about whether it really makes sense to uh, qualify as an S-Corp. Yeah. And I threw a, a blog post in the chat and we'll include it in the follow-up that uh, David wrote, actually, that went into the deep dive of that, why it's often just the best choice to set up a standard Delaware C-Corporation and just do things the standard way. The edge case is usually not worth the planning and the sacrificing. And I think we might have done it. We I don't know if you've seen the chat, David, but people are psyched. Um, <laughs> cool. Uh, this is fantastic. Uh, I think 30 minutes of Q&A is great. Um, any, any parting words or concepts that you want to drill in on to, David? 
Yeah, the world has changed a whole lot um, from when we first started teaching about term sheets. It was all about the intricacies of negotiating the NBCA model series documentation, which I covered in about 30 seconds at the end of, of this call. And that's where a lot of this term sheet negotiation stuff came from. Today, for the kind of early, early stage companies that are on this call that we deal with, with Gust and, and, and Gust Launch, uh, you will typically be using a safe, a convertible note, a series seed equity thing. And these have all been dramatically simplified because at the end of the day, they will all ultimately convert into the big NBCA docs, but only do so at a time in the future when you have a big money player in the way of a VC, big money lawyers who are getting paid 20, 30, 40 grand to go through all of this to do it. And at that point, you can discuss the future, the future things. So for right now, the one takeaway from here is standards, use a standard term sheet on Gust or elsewhere, number one. And number two, be rational in your valuation, right? Understand what's going on, understand that valuations are not where you might think they might be. Look around at the numbers that other companies are actually getting, not what's reported in the, in the press. And remember that it's always better to have a smaller piece of a bigger pie than 100% of an invisible pie. So with that, we wish you well in your company and your venture. We hope you'll stick around and come back for more of the sessions in this series where we're covering all sorts of things. Uh, if you'd like to say nice things about us, I, I thrive on praise um, and have a wonderful week. Thank you very much, David. And everybody, we will send out a recording of this uh, with some resources, a lot of these blog posts, a bunch of stuff that David's provided, some example term sheets, as I said 10 times in the chat, do not just sign term sheets offline. If you don't have a well-structured company through something like Gus Launch, downloading documents and executing them is only going to get you in more trouble than it's worth. But the examples are good to educate yourself. Good point. Good, good point, right? So because, uh, and what is the absolute worst thing you could do? The absolute worst thing you could do is to say, is to tell investors something like, oh, yes, we're using a safe document. And then you give them, you hand them a paper copy of a safe document that you have managed to tweak a little bit to do something in there. So it's not the original thing. I mean, if you ever tried that on any serious investor, you would be so deader than a doornail um, that it's not worth even discussing. So therefore, if you're going to use one of these stuff, strongly suggest that you use a standard form. Gus can help you obviously do it and online and everybody knows that it is, you can't change it. So it is there, what, what, is, what is there? Um, but always be totally, you know, high integrity, right? It all comes down to how you negotiate will be the beginning of your relationship with the investors. So be straight, be square, do it the right way. And at the end of the day, everybody benefits. Excellent. Well, thank you all for your fantastic questions, hanging out with us for a little bit longer. Um, be on the lookout for an email from me, nashagust.com with all the follow-up stuff. Uh, if you are in a situation where you need a new Delaware C Corp, you're thinking about it, email launch at gust.com. We have a, a whole team that knows about if convert, like we're not going to give you legal advice, but we'll tell you like what your options are. And if launch can play a good role in that, uh, we've just kicked off scale. So there's going to be a ton more stuff coming. We'll do an announcement on the overall program. We're still locking in some dates for some other stuff like that. And there will be more to come all summer and fall. Uh, and we'll probably have David back for something enlightening as well. Thank you all for your praise too. That felt really nice on this uh, Tuesday afternoon after a storm. And have a great evening, everybody. Thank you again, David. My pleasure. So long, folks.